Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the mental health and personality factors at work with the serial killer Israel Keys. Keys was a serial killer who traveled extensively and claimed to target victims at random. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. So first I'll take a look at Key's background, then the timeline of his crimes, then move to the mental health and personality factors. So starting with his background, we see that Keyes was born on January 7, 1978 in Richmond, Utah. He had no birth certificate and no social security number. He and all nine of his siblings were homeschooled. For the first several years of his life, he lived in a tent with his family as his father built a cabin in the woods. He learned how to hunt at a young age. At around age 10, he started breaking into homes, stealing guns, and setting fires. At age 14, he was torturing household pets, and he started to take pride in his ability to sit in the woods for hours without moving. It's amazing no one thought this was unusual, but I guess when you have 10 children living in a cabin in the woods, you can't always expect high quality parental supervision. Sometime between 1996 and 1998, Keyes assaulted a young girl in Oregon. He told investigators that he had planned on killing her, but decided against it. Keyes was in the Army from 1998 to 2001. Reports indicate that he drank heavily on the weekends during his time there. After he was honorably discharged, he and his girlfriend moved to Washington State. They had a child, but Keyes would leave for Alaska in 2005 to be with a new girlfriend who he met online. So perhaps a hint here that he had relational problems with women. In 2007, Keyes started a construction business in Alaska. He would live there as his base of operation as he traveled across the U.S. robbing banks and committing murders. Now moving to the timeline. So here we see that he committed a murder in 2012. And the other information we have about his murders, he provided after he was in custody. So I'm going to start with this murder in 2012. And I'll look at another crime he committed as he remembered it when he was in custody. So moving to February 1, 2012. Keyes removes the license plate, toolboxes, and ladder rack from his white pickup truck, and then drives to a coffee stand in Anchorage, Alaska. The only employee at that stand was 18-year-old Samantha Koenig. After placing an order, Keyes robbed Koenig. At one point during the robbery, he had her turn off the lights. The light switch was right next to a panic button, but she never pushed it. Keyes bound her hands with zip ties, and walked her out to his pickup truck. She attempted to escape by running away, but he caught her. After putting her in the truck, he realizes that she does not have her cell phone with her. So he drove back to the coffee stand to retrieve the phone. He used it to send two text messages, one to Koenig's boyfriend and the other to the owner of that coffee stand. The messages were designed to make it appear as though Koenig had a bad day at work and was leaving for the weekend. He then drives to his shed and he leaves her in there as he travels to her house. He wanted to retrieve her ATM card from her truck, which was parked at her house. As he was retrieving that ATM card, Koenig's boyfriend confronted him and then went back in the house to get help. During that time, Keyes escaped. He drove to an ATM machine to test the pin that Koenig had supplied him, and then he returned home. After this, he assaults Koenig sexually and murders her. He left her body in the shed and went to Texas, then Louisiana, from Louisiana, he took a Caribbean cruise. After returning from that cruise, he drove to Texas, and there he robbed a bank and set a house on fire after burglarizing it. After this, he made his way back to Anchorage, Alaska. Amazingly, this combination of travel and crime was not unusual for Keyes. At this point, he used Koenig's debit card to make an ATM withdrawal. He put makeup on Koenig's body and took a picture of her with her eyes open to make it look like she was still alive. The investigators who looked at the picture could not tell if she was alive or dead. He left a ransom note at a nearby park demanding $30,000 and disposed of her body at a lake by cutting a hole in the ice with a chainsaw. With the help of the community, Koenig's father collected the ransom and deposited it in an account connected with Samantha Koenig's ATM card. Keyes then flew to Nevada. He rented a car and drove to Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas making more withdrawals with that same debit card. One of the ATM machine cameras captured an image of his rental car, a white Ford Focus. 
March 3, 2012, a Texas state trooper spots a vehicle matching that description in a hotel parking lot. He follows the vehicle for a time and pulls Keyes over for speeding. After the trooper noticed that Keyes had an Alaska driver's license, he and another trooper searched Keyes and the car and found Samantha Koenig's cell phone, her ID, her ATM card, and a firearm. This is actually pretty amazing considering they did not have his license plate or a physical description of Keyes. They only knew he was driving a white Ford Focus. Now, some have said that Keyes was only caught because of the speeding. I have a feeling that the police would have found another reason to pull him over, even if it required some level of creativity. Like the trooper pulls him over, walks up alongside the car and says, oops, your taillight just spontaneously shattered. I assure you that its collision with my flashlight was unrelated. Sometimes they just find a way. He was sent back to Alaska to face charges. While in custody, Koenig's body was found in that lake. Keyes was indicted for kidnapping and murder. At this point, he confessed to the murder and started revealing more information about other crimes. Keyes made a number of claims about his activity as a serial killer. He said that he assembled what he referred to as kill caches. These were containers like a bucket that contained ammunition, guns, shovels, zip ties, money, and Drano. That was for getting rid of the bodies. He would bury these kits in various areas so that they would be available when he was ready to carry out a murder. Two of these kits were discovered. He claimed that he selected his victims at random. He scouted for victims on trails, campgrounds, parks, and cemeteries. He also sometimes targeted people in their homes, but he preferred houses with a detached garage, no car in the driveway, and no children or dogs as to increase his chances of not being arrested. He said that he was influenced by serial killers like Ted Bundy, but that he used his own ideas and didn't copy anyone else's. His motive seemed to be excitement. He liked the feeling he experienced when he was committing these crimes. Keyes did not provide a lot of details. He seemed to like the idea that he could toy with the investigators, keep them interested in his story, and build a mystique around himself. It was clear he thought of himself as a legendary serial killer. Keyes supplied a higher level of detail about the Courier murders, which took place on June 8, 2011. So Bill and Lorraine Courier were a couple that lived in Vermont. We see that Keyes cut the phone lines to their house, broke into it, and then abducted them. He took them to an abandoned farmhouse, at which time he murdered Bill, and then assaulted and murdered Lorraine. Their bodies were never recovered. As he recounted killing that couple, he seemed to enjoy it, and it was clear he liked getting attention from the investigators. Keyes also said that there were four victims in Washington State, and one victim he killed on the East Coast, but he would not provide the identities of those victims. December 2, 2012, 34-year-old Keyes was found dead in his jail cell. He had ended his own life. A letter was recovered from under his body, but the FBI determined that it had no value to the investigation. Under his bed, they also found drawings that he made using his own blood, which included 11 skulls, which may have represented the victims, but some people believe that the number of victims was greater than 11. My guess would be that the total really is 11, because I think Keyes would want credit for everything that he did as a serial killer. The FBI released a number of details about Koenig's travels across the United States from the late 90s up until the time he was arrested. When looking at this record, we see that Koenig traveled to a number of states, as well as Mexico, Canada, Belize, El Salvador, and Egypt, although he was in the military when he traveled to Egypt. He seemed to make the most trips to Washington State and California. He often rented cars and sometimes would drive over a thousand miles. Now moving to the mental health and personality factors. So Keyes was evaluated while in custody. He appears to have had antisocial personality disorder, substance use disorder, and higher than average intelligence. He had characteristics from both primary and secondary psychopathy. He was manipulative, had a lack of remorse, a lack of empathy. He was excitement seeking. He did not take responsibility for his actions and he had criminal versatility. He thought that eventually he would be caught, but he thought the ending would be much more dramatic, like he would be in a firefight with the police and they would kill him. He probably talked to investigators to feed his narcissism. He wanted to make sure the world knew he was responsible for the crimes, and he had never really been able to brag 
about his crimes to other people, one of the many downsides of the serial killing profession. But I think he planned to end his life the moment he was arrested. He said that being trapped in prison and potentially being executed was the worst possible outcome. Keyes had some elements in his history that are expected for a serial killer, like stealing, setting fires, taking pride in an ability to be stealthy, and hurting animals. But in other ways, he had an unusual history for a serial killer. For example, his only criminal history was a DUI, and his neighbors and customers remembered him as an upstanding member of the community. Keyes employed several strategies that allowed him to evade capture. A few examples of these strategies, he traveled a lot. Usually law enforcement looks locally when a murder occurs, and the vast majority of time, this is a good strategy. But Keyes would kill and then leave the state, so he was really getting around a lot of scrutiny. He did not have any connection to his victims, so that made it harder for him to be identified. He would place weapons and other materials he used in the crime in that area beforehand, like I talked about. This disconnected him somewhat from any record of collection of the materials used in the murder. Like the police may have been looking for someone who had purchased or stolen a weapon or other items used in the murders right before the murders happened, or they may have been looking for somebody who simply purchased those materials at any time, but in that local area. Keyes was able to sidestep both of these tactics. In the end, Keyes broke his own rules. He targeted somebody who lived in the same area as he did, and he allowed a photograph to be taken of his vehicle at that ATM. If he had not, he may never have been caught. I think what happened here is he simply gave in to desire. Keyes claimed that he had never seen or met Samantha Koenig. I'm not sure I believe this. This particular crime deviated quite a bit from his pattern. I think his drive grew too strong, and he believed he couldn't resist it. Just like most serial killers, his motivation was domination and sex. This case really highlights this idea that the very characteristics that make somebody capable of being a serial killer, like their motives, excitement-seeking, coldness, and impulsivity, ultimately lead to their arrest. I know whenever I talk about true crime cases, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching.